You know, this panel, we're gonna be talking about leading from the front line, supporting the most vulnerable through grassroots leadership after mega fires. And so I'm glad you came back in, Alfie, because I don't know if I look too good because I crawled out my makeup off and I had to use the crayons on the table to put my makeup back on. You know, it's amazing, as uh, Jennifer said, I ran a place called Chops Teen Club and we were impacted, of course, by the fires in Sonoma County and we had a facility that focused on tea. So an amazing place. It has a tech lounge and a cafe and, and a gym and all these amazing things. And when fires came, um, you know, here it is six years later and I was crying like a baby just to hear you out because it all comes back. You know, years later, it all still comes back. But, and thank you to all the youth serving people, but I do wanna say, you know, when you think about how you did it, when we had CHOPS and this happened in our community, when everyone was leaving, we stayed. And what I say also is be careful of mission drift. Be careful of trying to be everything because people told me I should collect food. People told me I should collect clothes. People told me I should do all these things. And I had to come back to the mission. What is the mission of CHOPS? It's a safe, fun place for teens to thrive. And it goes on from there. And so what was our mission? To provide a safe, fun place. Did I want to chase fire art grants and all these grants? And we're already doing art. But you know what the kids told us? We don't want to talk about fire. We, talk, we see our families, we lost our homes, we have to talk about at school. They just said, can we just have a place that's fun and then we don't talk about it? And then I also want to say, just to kind of, just because that youth panel touched me so much, another thing is we thought, okay, these kids are going to be so upset. They lost their Xbox, their PS4s, their bikes. So we're going to have to get money together to replace all that stuff. They didn't care. They weren't worried about it. They were actually very resilient. You know what affected those kids the most? What their families were going through, what their parents were going through. Their dad was restoring a car that was his dad's car and his dad's car, and now that car is burnt. That, my mom lost jewelry that my their great grandmother gave her. The kids were much more upset about that than their own stuff and their home. So there's trauma, but they're also sometimes more resilient than we give them credit for. So, I just want to thank the youth-centered people for that because it really touched me. And I hadn't planned to say all that, but um, I found myself in deep tears seven years later, still remembering what those feelings were like for those kids and those families. Enough about me. So as I said, our panel today is really talking about the most vulnerable. And I'm going to ask a couple of you to answer the question. And I thought about it when I asked the question. The assumption is vulnerable is same in every community. And after today, I thought about it, I'm like, vulnerable might look different in different communities. For example, in Sonoma County, we have a very high senior population. It's kind of off the charts. That's a whole economic thing, but we'll talk about that another time. Um, so when I asked the question, you may even say to me, like, you know what? My vulnerable population was a little different. But first, we're going to start with introductions. So why don't we start on this end with you, Rebecca, and um, grab a microphone and give a little introduction, talk about where the, well, you you kind of got an extensive fire journey, but if you could talk a little bit about yourself and some of the work you've done and the fires that you were involved in supporting community. Aloha. My name is Rebecca Uccellini Kubi, and um, my background is in regenerative system design. I, um, I grew up with parents that moved around all the time. My father was a spiritual anthropologist and my mother worked for Doctors Without Borders. And so it sort of was in my blood in some way. Um, my, mom, my mama had Hanai family in Hana, Maui, east side of Maui. And so um, that became the place for me that was most home in the world uh, where I lived the longest. Um, and in 2010, I started working on a grant that was aimed at reducing health disparities for Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and low-income community members. Uh, and it was um, by reconnecting them to the land, planting um, food forests and community gardens in places that did not have access. And uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Native Hawaiians have the highest rate of health disparities. And I truly believe a lot of that is because of the disconnection from the land and um, what has happened really over the last 150 years. And so that became my heart and soul. Um, and in 20, 
15, I had my own sort of disaster. Um, I was paralyzed and lost the ability to speak and I had to leave um, Maui and sort of follow the medicine. And strangely, as I went to follow the medicine, uh, fires began sort of following me. Um, at first I thought it was something like serendipitous and then I realized uh, those maps you see, saw earlier today where it's just fires across the whole Pacific Northwest in California. Um, but in my community, I was living uh, in Sonoma County during 2017, and uh, a number of my community members lost their homes in the fire. And um, I had, while I was on Maui, for about two to three months of the year, every year I would leave and I would do work abroad and I would do work with refugees and climate refugees, war refugees, um, a lot of work in Africa and places that really didn't have access to food and clean water and basic needs of survival. So my focus is really access equality. Uh, and then I moved to Santa Cruz Mountains, the CZU fire, where she spoke about a uh, thousand um, homes were lost, uh, and that fire came right up to our home. And then um, in 2023, we actually lost our home. We had a bomb cyclones, eight in a row, and had um, 64 of our, our uh, community members had giant trees that came right through. We had mudslides um, come through, and we had eight trees down on our home. Uh, everything filled with water and flooding. And so then I now had to walk my own community through it um, and myself uh, along the way for the CZU fire. Because it was a fire that happened during a pandemic, it was a double disaster. And there was this huge opening because of that, we couldn't follow the status quo. We couldn't even have everyone come to an evacuation center. And so because everyone was, you know, having to wear masks and not be around each other. And so what ended up happening was there was a huge opening for what do we do? How do we do this more effectively? And so I was able to um, support starting something called Santa Cruz Relief, a really effective mutual aid organization. And we were able to support 700 fire survivors through that process. Uh, and so when the fires happened in Maui, I, um, and I was working uh, in 20, I think 10 to 20, 13, I was, was working in Lahaina, um, started a garden up at Lahaina Luna School, which was once one of the most effective agricultural programs that they had, and we were re revitalizing that program, and uh, worked at Kamehameha the third elementary school, and so those kids, they called me Auntie Rebecca, and that was something that was so deep, and um, that community was so deep in my bones and my blood, and and so as soon as the fires happened, um, I was back on Maui. And yeah, I've been honored to work with um, a number of these incredible women, Nicole and Kukui. And, um, and then really now my focus has just been catching the most vulnerable and unmet needs in the, commu in the community as, as best as I can. So mahalo. Aloha, my name is Kukui Keahi. Um, I am a non-generation survivor from Lahaina. Um, both sides of my family are deeply rooted on uh, in Lahaina. That's all I've known, all I've grown up to be. Um, I was lucky to end up working for CNHA, Accounts for Native Hawaiian Advancement, for a pop-up they did after hearing the call or the kahe for a Kako'o Maui Resource Center. Since then, we've expanded to another recovery center and we've also started a distribution center. I oversee the Maui operations uh, for the for all of our um, recovery efforts. And I think that's, um, I'm blessed to know that I'm from Lahaina, for Lahaina. I'm from my community, by my community. Um, and more than anything, I'm very blessed to be in a position to give back to the community and honored to give back to those that raised me. Um, thank you for going. <laughs> I threw you off a little bit. My name is Nicole, and um, let me be brief. I, uh, di responding disasters started early for me. I was a survivor of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, we were rescued by the National Guard, and it's just been in my blood since then. Um, I've also was evacuated um, as a visitor in Boulder, Colorado during the thousand year flood um, and been through many fires. Um, <clears throat> my professional background is in nonprofits and mostly teaching. And um, in 2012, I left all of that because I was um, tired of 
um, cash being the most valuable thing and what really drove decisions. And I started to really dive into experiments that, um, how do I say it? Uh, care, like t how we reevaluate um, caring and bring it up as a, as a currency um, and aloha and, and, and that sort of thing. And so that evolved into many different projects. People call me a generosity entrepreneur. Um, uh, here right now, most people in this room know me as the executive director of my rapid response, but you'll probably meet me in three months and I'll be something else. <laughs> Whatever is called from that day. So that's what I do. I show up. My name is Amber Ferguson. I'm the executive director at Rogue Food Unites. Uh, we came about after the 2020 wildfires, specifically the Alameda fire. Um, and I'm really honored to be up here with these badass women leaders, and that is uh, such a privilege. I would really like to read what I wrote so I don't miss anything. Um, Originally, we set out with the immediate goal to provide hot meals three times a day to those thousands of people that were displaced. We did this by creating relationships with existing food businesses. This, both, this had both an economic benefit to support our hospitality industry that was shuttered because of COVID and to provide care for our neighbors who lost everything. Our programs have shifted and changed over the last four years depending on who and what we are in service to. We are now contracted to respond in all 36 Oregon counties. The impact of these programs have had lasting effects on physical and mental health. We have been able to foster new and robust community connections, and I believe we are a more resilient community because of this. We have built trust that is lasting. Our team is growing and moves with deep integrity. My wish is to sit with you all around a table overflowing with the bounty of laughter, tears, beautiful food, flowers, and music as we mark the four-year anniversary of the 2020 wildfires and the birth of Rogue Food Unites, I'm overwhelmed by the gratitude I feel for this journey, the incredible people that I've met and the work we continue to do in service of our communities. Despite the challenges, there's profound beauty and resilience we've shown and the joy we've created together. I'm committed now more than ever to building spaces where everyone feels seen, loved, and celebrated. In this season of change, I hold tightly to hope, a hope that requires our constant nurturing, and I extend that to all of you. Um, along with my deepest thanks for walking this path with me, we have a grand opportunity to do things differently, to get into the river and divert the stream. Our mission is simple, provide beautiful, healthful, love-filled food so that those experiencing crisis might have the strength to do the next hard thing. Food is just the first step. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Melissa Bauer, and I work at Sanium Hospital and Clinics in Oregon. And part of what I do is um, oversee our disaster case management program. Um, but just a little back history on how I got involved in um, social services and just meeting the needs of our community is um, I grew up with a mom and dad who um, was always encouraging us to go out and serve. And I heard my mom shared her story with us where she um, grew up without food on the table and her sisters didn't have everything that they needed and they often slept in um, cars and had a father with a dual diagnosis. Um, and when she was eight years old, they had a house fire and she um, ended up being at the San Francisco Burn Center uh, for 11 months. Um, and then when she recovered and was able to leave, uh, she was discharged to um, their van at the time. And so growing up and hearing that story and seeing my mom and how resilient she's been is what um, really drove me into this field and landed myself at a hospital where um, we really believe that addressing the social needs of an individual is healthcare, and that healthcare is a right for everyone. And so they, I started a program um, in 2017 called Service Integration, and we have four different teams in different school district catchment areas, and the teams are made up of faith-based organizations, nonprofit, state, federal, and county government, as well as businesses and private citizens. And each team has a pot of funds um, that the hospital provides and the school district provides. And 
the team members build relationships, they integrate and they collaborate together um, to meet the needs that pop up in the community. There's over 300 team members and um, it's just a remarkable program. And so when the fire, um, Beachy Creek Lionheads fire in 2020 hit our community, we were just naturally in a place where we had that relationship with the community. We knew exactly who we needed to call um, and we just quickly mobilized and we had a wonderful um, business, Ferris Lumber, who contacted us the day after the fire and said, we want service integration um, to be the hub of the community and take on the donation center as well as a private fund. Um, and that fund raised about $5 million that our disaster case managers uh, were able to connect survivors to. Um, so our program, a lot of times you hear like of a DCM program coming in when um, FEMA has done all their declaration and has deployed a program. Um, and our disaster case managers started a month after our fire um, and our team started two days after the fire and meeting immediate needs. Um, and so our program has continued without um, any interruption and really proud to say um, that in October we'll have just about 19 families that we will continue to work with on the rebuild process, but the rest of those we have been able um, well, they, the survivors, have been able to um, close and meet their unmet needs. Melissa, I'm glad that you, this little Nat, I'm glad that you brought up relationships. That has been a theme that we've heard today and we'll come back to it. But for the first question, I want to have Amber and Kakui answer this question first. And if anybody wants to add anything to it, please do. Each of you has been on the front lines of responding to mega fires in your communities. How did you identify the needs of the most vulnerable populations? And if you even want to mention who you identified as some of those vulnerable populations, because I think that's important to actually call out specifically. I was lucky enough, um, CNHA had already started a disaster like type situation back in COVID. So we, they already had the ability and the capacity to reach out a lot quicker than some other organizations. So we were able, and being a part of the community, we were able to report back. Um, so the staff that was initially hired is from Lahaina. We all got thrown in not knowing that we were all being put together in this organization. We all come from different backgrounds. So when we met in the center, we kind of looked at each other and was like, oh, we're working together? Okay, this works, and long story short, we're related. Um, so it made it that much easier. We weren't as close as we are today because of where we work, but it was each of us being in the community in different capacities, the different organizations we worked for, the companies we worked to worked for prior to the fire. We had a lot of outreach um, to figure out what is needed. And we were able to bring that back to our executives and our directors to say, hey, this is what's needed. We created um, programs instantly off the bat to help with rental assistance, to help homeowners. We created even a program with FEMA where they allowed us to fill, fill what is called a gap in rental assistance. Some of us know that usually after disaster, rent gets extremely out of control. And on Maui, a five bedroom was standard at 5,000. The max that you could get from FEMA was 2,900. There's still a $2,000, $2,100 gap that these families have to try to fill if they found housing on their own. So our executives were able to meet with FEMA and say, hey, why don't we create this program? So it was things like that that was just very innovative. Our host program, it's very common in Hawaii to live with your ohana, live with 10 generations, you know? And so a lot of the family and friends, it's normal for us to say, hey, come, come stay with me. And so we were able to build a host program where if you took in any of your friends or family that were impacted, we were able to pay each for each person uh, $500. We maxed out at 2000 and that's just to alleviate the families of taking them in on their increased bills or food, because it's not very common of us either in our culture to ask. Um, so that was something for us to give and not make it uncomfortable. So vulnerable communities, I'm gonna just say the multi-generational um, for me would be who I would reach out as my vulnerable, um, especially the kupunas who are in their 80s who had these family homes and now we don't know what's next. 
Just real quick for Amber speak, I just, you know, it also reminds me that we talk in general, communities, cities, places, but they have their own special cultures that's really important to recognize and appreciate. And Amber, food insecurity is not new, right? And even years later, you're still doing that work. But if you could talk about how you got started in supporting the food needs of the community. Yeah, my background is in hospitality and food and beverage. And similarly, it's in... Uh, in, in my genetics, my father is in his 58th fire season right now, and uh, it's always been to run towards it. But specifically, our fire discriminated and took uh, apart so many um, marginalized community members, from, uh, family homes and farm workers and our Latino communities, um, and everybody that already didn't need that to happen. Many families living in smaller homes and homes that were underinsured and can't necessarily be replaced at all because they are now deemed in flood zones or the prices have gone up. And as we know, I'm similarly really to Kukui's experience. Before we move on, I wanted to see if Rebecca, Nicole, or Melissa wanted to add anything about supporting vulnerable populations before we move to the next question. Challenges are often inevitable as any part of any crisis response. Could you share a particular decision or obstacle that you faced during your work and what you learned from that experience? Um, an obstacle, I mean, I would, I would say, to be honest, the obstacle I've faced is the system itself, um, the way it's designed. Uh, coming from regenerative system design background, I see patterns and systems uh, really clearly. And, you know, after the fire happened, what we got to see that was so powerful was community helping community. It was self-organized. It was something no one will ever forget that was there. Nobody had to tell us how to do it. People showed up, people from Molokai, people got in their assembly lines, gas needed, food needed, whatever it was. And there was this deep remembering that is in all of our bones that we actually know how to take care of each other really well. And we've gotten away from that. And then all of a sudden, I feel like it was almost like this whistle got blown. Like, we interrupt this programming. Carrot, carrot, run over here. Money, 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 money. And it was like, oh, what? And everyone just was like, I guess this is what you're supposed to do. Run, Red Cross Fund is ending, My People's Fund ending, FEMA Fund run, and people just are like traumatized completely, and they're just like, I guess this is what we have to do. We'll just start going that way. And it's so dehumanizing. I watched people stand in line for over an hour for a $15 gift card. And we rip people away from that deeper knowing when we do that. And then the next section of the disaster recovery begins, which I like to call the FEMA obstacle course. And all of a sudden you're now racing and you're having to jump over hoops or go under this other one and go through this thing and this other thing and you're so distracted by all these steps you gotta do and oh, you forgot this one thing, your landlords didn't sign the date. So you start back at the beginning again. I have got people waiting nine months for FEMA reimbursement that have cancer. They lost, they had 26 people in their family that lost their home. The cancer came back the third time. I don't have anything, I don't know what to tell them because it's the system. The system is set up in this way and I've tried everything I can to work within the system. You know, and the CZU fire was easier for me in some ways because there was this opening, they had never done it before with COVID, and so they were so open to listening and to doing system design changes. And um, while Maui's been really successful in some of those in terms of the cultural piece, uh, we're still stuck with the same kind of roadblocks. And in terms of like the most vulnerable people, it's those people you think that can't run a race in an obstacle course. I've got elderly, kupuna, cancer cases, autistic people, I've got so many um, multi-generational families, those who are deeply traumatized, those who lost family members. I had people that went to a funeral for their family member and they came back and were kicked out of the hotel. Mm. And I was just like, so I would say the most challenging thing has been the system, you know? And I want to also encourage that like, 
you know, especially my Maui community here, you guys have the opportunity to actually change that system and to say, nope, this is not our way, and to encourage every leader here that it's up to us to be able to ask for these system changes, to know that it's flawed. We, have, we, we humans make up all these crazy flawed systems that we just accept, oh, it's just the way it is. It's not the way it needs to be because we're living in the time of disasters and if we don't get it right right now, we're never going to. And community is the most effective way at ensuring that you guys are gonna be okay for future disasters. So supporting those community organizations, commu supporting those that are on the ground and the grassroots. And when we create programs that catch the most vulnerable, if you don't have the most vulnerable at the round table, invite them in because if they're not there, we're gonna continuously design programs that fail. And if we catch the most vulnerable, we will catch everyone else. So, mahalo. Yeah, Nicole, and you may have another story you want to share, but I remember the, sh the story about your the auntie and the tree. I don't know if that's the story uh, you want to share or something else, but. I have a different story okay. to share, but a challenge that I had to, to um, sit with is, you know, for us, we were already in the community in a different way, um, taking care of people that um, were disenfranchised from their ohanas, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the vulnerable populations. One of the growing vulnerable populations right now are a lot of um, women, older women that were stay-at-home moms, and so they don't get they get the lowest amount of social security because they don't have the hours, um, and they're divor they're divorced, and so they're, that's actually one of the highest growing numbers of um, people in one of our shelters at the moment. Um, I. I just keep thinking too about the, the rural health study that just came out and it clearly said the most vulnerable are Native Hawaiians. Um, and um, for me, the hardest decision was in our organization to actually stay out of those systems. And I think it became really easy to do that when CNHA was stood up fully and they, we knew that we could get there was a center to get people through and Rebecca was there. Um, and so we just got out of our offices and just went out on the street. And we didn't stop and we have not stopped. And so when our data goes from 42% um, post COVID of people that are near or below the poverty level to 68%, it's over half of this room, well over half of this room. 68% of people in Maui right now, based off of the rural health study, is in poverty or below. And what that means, um, I'll, I'll tell the story, is this, this one woman we had had a baby in January. It was one fire survivor, she had a baby in January. And they were in the um, rental assistance program they had gotten in early. And their rent, um, you know, you have to front the money for FEMA several months, so it's a big lift. So if your rent is $4,000, a three-month chunk of that, a big lift. We had a baby, we got them diapers, um, preemie, preemie sized diapers, and the, um, I had to have this conversation with her, or it wasn't me, it was somebody else, it was me and somebody else, and, the conversation was, you, you actually can't tell some people that we gave you diapers because it will disqualify you for di diapers later. That's hard, right? That's really hard. They, if you were really building systems to trust people, we would allow them to choose what they need in that moment. Um, and so that was the first time, I think she, that held in her mind and already in a culture that doesn't ask, uh, when the baby had a little growth spurt, but then they're also their electricity bill shot through the roof uh, because they have a new person in and they're also in a new home. It was a totally different electrical structure. It was double what they had ever paid before. She needed cash. So what did she do? She sold the, the preemie diapers that she had extra that her child didn't fit in anymore on Facebook Marketplace. And there was a big uproar big community up where, and, and she got slammed in the community for it. Like, 
wow, she, okay, she's slamming some of the things that we gave her. We, or, you know, she's, she's selling them. And I said, hold on. Go talk to her. So they went, uh, the person who last talked to her went to talk to her. And she said, well, I needed, to, our, I needed $80 more. Our, our electric would get shut off. She didn't realize, nobody had said that electricity wasn't going to get shut off for a year or, or whatever the, it is now. Um, and my baby grew, and I didn't know that I could ask for a different size. So we just engaged in a conversation with her and built relationship and trust. And that woman now, with her baby, a six-month-old baby, drives diapers to any woman. She will drive to Haiku, pick up diapers from Pacific Birth Collective, and take it to any woman. I don't ever have to find a driver ever again because we deepened our relationship. And we did that outside of the system, and that was, that was the challenging choice. Do we stay in or do we stay out so that we can be the stopgap for people that are having a hard time asking for help that don't trust systems. I have another um, Kanaka gentleman uh, list. One of the things that I do is tell the most recent story. Most recent story is um, the night that I flew here, um, I got a call that um, a young man was suicidal. And it's, it's a common call that our team gets. And so we called the crisis line. We pulled in the system. His, his lights had gone out. And, um, he, he lost his legs, um, I think the surgery was in March, and he had both of his legs amputated. And um, FEMA's had a really hard time finding him a ADA unit for him to be in, and right now he's on the fourth floor. And the um, electricity went out in Kihei, that's where he is, and he felt very trapped. And the crisis worker took four hours to get there, so we, we went out. Um, and we ended up having to call the um, fire department, and eight firemen carried him down four, um, four, four levels of stairs, and we sat with him for six hours. He will, this person will not call anything. For him, the systems have failed, and he was very close, and there are many people that are making that choice because they feel so disenfranchised, and it, um, and so for us, that decision was, we're going to stay out of the system. And I've taken a lot of heat for it, a lot of heat for it. Um, but on the flip side of that is it's actually also deepened our connection to the community and helped build a platform for those people that want to give back after once they are ready. Thank you for that story. I think, you know, the stories help to really remind us and bring it to life. And when you talk about connection to community, I want you all to remember that because that was a very strong theme and takeaways of the work. Um, like so many, you just did what needed to be done. You just got in because you saw something, an emergency in your community needed you. But many of you, along with your loved ones, and Melissa, I'm going to have you follow up about that story about not showing your own self-care and then what that reflects to your staff. But many of you, along with your loved ones and friends, experienced personal loss during the fires, including the loss of your own homes. How did you take care of yourself while managing the overwhelming work of helping others? And if you're looking back, what's the best self-advice you could give yourself now? You look back and you go, this is the, the best self-advice about around care for yourself. Sure. Um, well, we, I think my story when we were talking about this earlier is that I, we didn't care for ourselves initially. And, um, and I wanted, as a leader, I wanted to come to work and I wanted to be strong for the team. And I didn't want to show my emotions. And everything was fine. That's what we always said. Everything's great. And um, it's like almost embarrassing to say this because I feel like I should have had more of a closer eye on the team, but it was about a year and a half in and, and one of my colleagues came to me and she said, um, Melissa, the team isn't fine. And uh, I said, are you sure? I was like, because that's what we say to each other, everything's fine. And um, she said, no, they're really not fine. And, and so, I think we focus so much on being there and listening to the stories and um, being there for survivors because that's part of the healing process. And that day, it dawned on me that our team needed to heal. And um, 
we got together and, and we talked and just listened to each other and we closed the office for the rest of the afternoon and and we we had a lot of loss. We have had um, survivors who have taken their lives. We've had um, physical health conditions that um, took people's lives. And so, what our what our team needed at that time is, um, you know, that your first thought as a healthcare provider is, we'll give you a workshop, and that's not that's not what they needed. Um, and that's what the LTRG, you know, which is great. They they requested that and funded it, and the team said, "That's that's not. I I I know I'm supposed to breathe. I know I'm supposed to go home and put different socks on, like someone mentioned yesterday." And um, but what they needed is just to stand in a circle and requested some pastors of ours, and we just we talked about um, the people that we've lost and um, planted a tree for them. And we just were in the moment and let our emotions be real and, um, and release the trauma that we've been, we were carrying uh, for over a year. And, and I think now and moving forward, um, we're a team of emotions. <laughs> our, uh, our team is constantly checking in with each other and, um, and, it's, and it's okay to not be okay. Um, and I think we've recognized that. And talking to um, Devin with uh, McKinsey Valley LTRG, he's here somewhere. But um, is right now is, you know, our team is a, in a challenging spot with the OHCS and the CDBG dollars. And, um, and they are not okay right now all the time. And so we're gonna meet up with Devin and we're gonna take a self-care day and just be able to collaborate with another group that's doing recovery. But um, it's just important to feel the feelings. Yeah, we have a few minutes left. I would have loved all of you to answer that, especially Amber, because you've been in it longer and we have our family here who's newer to this, but I have limited time. So I hope that you share that so that our, our sisters here stay fortified as they need to be fortified because it's still very rare, new and recent. But I wanna end with, out of such a life-changing experience, are there any positive outcomes or silver linings that emerged? And one of the things that stuck with me, I don't know what the quote was and who said it, but disaster starts local and ends local, was that the quote? Like that was, I circled that multiple times that it starts local and ends local. But, you know, we've talked about relationships, how important relationships, community. But if you could quickly in, you know, a couple of minutes, I'd like to give you each a chance and maybe we start in the end with Rebecca since she hasn't spoke of just what is out of something, right, that is traumatic and horrible and uh, has a lot of um, trauma to it but there's always something, right? There's, a, there's always a silver lining or a takeaway, or at least we try to find one to keep us going. Do you have anything that you would like to share? And hopefully we have a chance, to, if, if it's just a couple of words for each of you to share something. Because I think it's, we're talking about some heavy stuff and you gotta leave with something that keeps you motivated and energized to pick it up and do it again. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, um, seen so many local leaders emerge. I mean, sitting right here on this seat right here and in this room, uh, so many Hawaiian leaders finding their purpose and it being awoken in them. Um, you, could, you could witness, you could watch it happen and it feels like a really big shift uh, for all of the islands um, because of it, seeing all these, these young emerging leaders um, I'd say if one other thing was just for the first time I've always wanted to do this and was able to do it during this fire was um, creating our own disaster recovery center that was land-based and um, was able to do it at the Maui Nui Botanical Gardens right across from the War Memorial, surrounded by native plants and trees and providing a different approach to disaster recovery outside in fresh air, getting Lomi Lomi, being able to get acupuncture, music therapy, all the things, having your children play right there in a safe space and um, something I hope can get carried into future disasters. That was a beautiful event, yeah. I think if, um, if, the, if 
the local community is the first and last responder, then I think on the flip side too, that disasters are the best, the very best and the very worst of us. And, and I think um, Noelani said it yesterday too, there was a moment in time when the 37 community hubs were operating that community was just flawless, flawlessly the care for me in my life, and I mentioned it earlier, I, I, I needed to see how care could actually be more valuable than cash. And that is exactly what happened. We actually had 42, I know because I was the one who sent the spreadsheet to the person who made the spreadsheet. There were 42 hubs of those 37 were community led. And there's still some standing today. Um, that for me, experiencing that and having a lot of other people experience and remember the village. Like really remember, like Noe said, not go home for dinner. We're eating together. We're, we're going to, like you were, you're standing in line for the diapers and the medicine or the acupuncture and you're talking with each other and knowing instead of hiding what you need. And we can, in the moment, respond and care for each other. That, for me, was um, still fuels me to this day. Oh, time is here, but what I can say, when we all met, the biggest theme of the Silver Linings was community, community. They feel like their community is closer, more connected. They see each other. They know each other. Deeper relations have been there. And even relationships, we talked about relationships with government agencies don't not have them, have them. So, you know, for me, it's been such an honor to meet each of you and hear your stories. I wish we could be here so much longer. I want to thank Miss Jennifer Gray Thompson for letting me do this for the third year in a row, and I, and I appreciate you. So the silver lining for me is, was Emergent Leaders. Um, so much of my family stood up. I have some in the audience, and I'm super proud. Um, a lot of us don't come from the best background, so to be able to stand up and be these leaders for our family, to hear the older generations thank us is huge for me. Um, also, the community that was built, the Pilina, the relationships that were built after everything. Some people I didn't talk to, I actually flew on a plane with people here I didn't know, and now I can, we're laughing at a table. Um, but also, there was uh, policies and things that we were able to change to allow federal government into a community-based center that was never heard of before. So things like that where we are making a change and we are making a difference. Um, and it all starts with culture. Uh, I think our silver linings are many. Uh, a more resilient and connected community of leaders. Uh, that happened because our elders in our community passed on that knowledge and the, uh, the power to have young leaders rise. And I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, as well as we have been able to create a very uh, wonderful relationship with the Office of Resilience and Emergency Management in Oregon, and they really do support what community wants. I'm very grateful for that. Mine would be neighbors helping neighbors. Let's see one quick example under a minute. Um, but we had a survivor who needed a medical bed and another survivor donated the medical bed to that person, not knowing who they were. It was through our DCM. And then the person that received the medical bed ended up donating firewood to the other to the individual that donated the medical bed, and they were they were delivering the firewood when they realized in that conversation that they had received the bed, and she was getting the firewood, and it was just a beautiful story. But um, so neighbors helping neighbors, I love that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>